How important is this meeting today? Well, really, I mean, if you had to say it in one word, word, it's about China. Not to be cynical, I mean, I know we hear the administration talk a lot about their proactive use of this sort of lattice work, as they call it, of Indo-Pacific partnerships. But really, what this trilateral meeting is about is helping uh, shore up an alliance, a creative new grouping mm -hmm. of Indo-Pacific partners for the U.S. and show support for, for what they're trying to do to defend against uh, attacks and, and what the U.S. says is increasing coercion and uh, aggressiveness in the South China Sea and other disputed waters in the Indo-Pacific. So perhaps instead of a North Atlantic alliance like NATO is, this is a new Pacific alliance, Dan. Yeah, I mean, this is an effort that's gone back uh, certainly to the beginning of the Biden administration. And, you know, you saw a little bit of it in the, in the prior administration as well. But and I, uh, the idea here is basically to shore up these alliances in the, in the Indo-Pacific, as you said, and to basically have these friendships, these alliances, these things in place, should something happen, you know, an invasion of Taiwan, an embargo, a trade embargo with Taiwan, some other action by China that stops short of a full-on invasion, and basically have everybody sort of on the same page. And, and you know, you see this um, ongoing with a lot of trips, uh, certainly by, by members of the State Department and, and others to the, um, sorry, not to the Middle East, to the we'll Indo-Pacific. We'll get there. <laughs> um, but, uh, but now, you know, kind of cementing that with, with the visit uh, today. Well, to what extent, uh, to Kaylee's point, can this be uh, consolidated and, and formalized? As long as China is considered a threat, should there be something closer to a NATO? We're actually talking about Japan helping to support or work as a second pillar to the AUKUS alliance. How about connecting the dots on all of these? Is that possible? Yeah, a lot of that formalization is is really long in coming, I think. I, what we're hearing from officials is we're in early talks on this, we're in early talks on that. But mm -hmm. I think really what we're looking at coming out of this trilateral today is what are they going to do about what they've signaled uh, is an increasing uh, plan to use joint military drills, as they did on Sunday with Australia, Japan, Philippines, the U.S. That's right. that, that sort of squad, as I've heard some officials mm -hmm. call it, um, is, is going to be drawn on in the future, and they just haven't been specific, specific about where and how frequent those drills will continue, but that is a major development in terms of defending in the South China Sea. Yeah, so obviously one theater to keep an eye on, and there's other theaters as well, as Dan brings up, the Middle East, yeah. and potentially what is a coming Iranian retaliation for the strike Israel conducted in Damascus against an Iranian embassy. We don't know exactly what form it could take, but U.S. officials have voiced uh, concern about it being imminent. And we spoke about it with retired General Mark Kimmett earlier today on balance of power. What exactly Iran could do here? This is what he said. It would be likely that perhaps not in the Middle East, but Iran could in fact go after an Iranian, uh, go after an Israeli embassy somewhere in South America that would take their fingerprints on of it, off of it if they use a group like Hezbollah. Uh -huh. um, and uh, there wouldn't be direct attribution. So it kind of raises the question, Dan, of whether this would be Iran directly, an Iranian proxy, as the general thought might be more likely. And frankly, how aggressive or de-escalatory Iran may want to be here. What does the U.S. fear will happen? What do they think is most likely to happen? Well, certainly the biggest fear that, that the administration has at this point is just a general escalation of tensions in the Middle East. You know, we've seen some uh, and heard some, you know, no, some noise from, from the Israelis that, you know, the operation in Gaza may start to wind down a little bit. Um, you know, whether that actually comes to fruition, we need to see. But uh, a strike by Iran on, uh, on any sort of Israeli asset in the region would certainly be an escalatory action. There's no way to view it in, in any other uh, case. Uh, but uh, a strike, an indirect strike, as the general suggested, uh, that Iran could deny in some sense, even though there, there would certainly be linkages that, that people would point to, would be something that stops short of that full-scale escalation. Although, um, you know, what could happen after that point is sort of uh, we're entering into somewhat uncharted territory because we haven't really seen this sort of full-scale mm -hmm. conflagration in the Middle East uh, yet. And, and I think that's what the administration has been trying to avoid. Well, this is the White House that's spinning a lot of plates in a dangerous world right now. The press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, uh, talked earlier today about terrible news from Ukraine. Russia's missile attack on a power plant near Kyiv, the biggest one in the Kyiv region, it is now out of commission and there are great concerns about the lack of ammunition in Ukraine. Here's the press secretary. 
Russia launched another large round of aerial assaults against Ukraine's energy grid as Vladimir Putin continues to try to break the spirit, the spirit of the Ukrainian people and plunge them into darkness. Russia struck the largest power plant in Kyiv Oblast as well as a power facilities in five other regions across Ukraine. Michelle, I don't know if we can connect the dots uh, between what's been happening here with the concerns uh, that the U.N. has right now about the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant with the lack of ammo. But clearly the skies are not being defended in Ukraine across the country, uh, at least as much even as we were seeing before. This White House is going to continue talking about headlines like this mm -hmm. until funding is passed and there's no path for that to take place. Yeah. Joe Biden, Biden is running out of options here. Yeah, and in some ways this is the same conversation we've been having since before the winter set in because you know we, we had National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby talking about how the winter would be a trying time and that yeah. they knew that Russia would try to attack the energy infrastructure especially to really cripple Ukraine. So we're at that stage and yet uh, you know in talking about Ukraine funding and going back to Prime Minister Kishida in in the Congress today, mm -hmm. uh, we saw him you know kind of make that call for for allies to support the Ukraine funding, and some of the Republican stalwarts against that funding were, sitting were clearly seated and yeah. sitting on their hands in that, in that format. So mm -hmm. we'll see where it goes from here, but really hasn't been much movement in that conversation. Well, you f can find Republicans easily who are opposed to further funding for Ukraine, but you could also find 19 of them yesterday who were opposed to advancing legislation <laughs> for a five-year extension of FISA, the Foreign Surveillance Warrantless Surveillance Act, specifically uh, Section 702. That was a five-year extension. We now understand from our Bloomberg report on the Hill, that lawmakers are now going to try to pass a two-year extension. The Rules Committee is going to sit with it tonight. There will be votes early tomorrow morning. How important is it for U.S. national security that this gets done, Dan? What do you hear on this issue? Well, certainly when you talk to folks in the administration and you talk to folks on the Hill who are proponents of this measure, they say that without this, the U.S. will basically go dark, that it will have no ability to really see into certainly conversations between foreign adversaries and folks who may be uh, planning stuff or communicating with them here on U.S. soil. The issue, of course, is do U.S. citizens get swept up in that kind of, of a dragnet? And that is really the question. That's what former President Donald Trump has, has made a lot of noise about and his, his uh, allies in Congress. But really, you know, if you listen to the national security folks on this, they'll say, without this, we're sort of blind and we don't know what's going on. Um, but you talk to some of the civil, um, you know, liberty advocates or some of the folks who are on the right or the left, and they say this is really warrantless surveillance. This is uh, ca catching U.S. citizens in a way that is not intended. Uh, and so maybe a two-year extension is a way to sort of keep this uh, debate alive to a certain extent. I mean, it would certainly uh, land it in the middle of the next administration, whoever's in office. Yeah. And so, you know, that may be seen as, as a way to keep this debate going um, in order to satisfy some of the critics and some of the proponents at the same time.